Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm Alexander Fleiss here with Perry Boyle, brilliant fund manager, was one of Stevie Cohen's top lieutenants, has had an amazing career, Solomon Brothers, Bankers Trust. This uh, man ran a uh, panel discussion at the MFA conference a few years ago, and I was like, wow, one of the smartest minds I've come across in you know, 26 years of uh, working on Wall Street. Perry, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks and for having me. It's my pleasure. We're going to discuss uh, how to run a long short book. So, uh, you know, uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, first, uh, the, the, the obvious question, I guess, for many is, do you have a recommended percentage of shorts for every dollar long? Ooh, um... Well, short theses tend to play out faster than long theses, and uh, and most of them, you know, you can only go to zero on a short, right? So, and and most of your shorts, uh, when they work, they become smaller positions. Yeah. So, uh, short idea generation is the bane <laughs> of uh, a tight net uh, equity manager. Um, you know, one and a quarter to two times as many short positions as long as longs uh, is very helpful. It's really hard to come up with enough shorts. And as you know, a lot of um, a lot of managers, uh, you know, use what I think of as lazy shorts, ETFs, and those are terrible hedges. Um, they don't volatility match. Uh, one of my my guys once said, uh, "Hedging your book with ETFs is like going to work in sweatpants," um, which probably is a lot more common now in COVID. But uh, uh, yeah, short short idea generation is critical. So if someone says, "You know, I, I think the economy is a little weak. I want a short consumer staple." You think of uh, taking the consumer staple ETF as kind of a, a lazy short still, even if it's a little more specified or. How do you feel about well, that, that? You know, uh, that, that's better. But, you know, my experience is in a tight net non-directional market where it's really the alpha from individual stocks, individual companies, not so much that kind of a trend like, you know, the economy's going down, we're going to short the market. In fact, uh, uh, you know, the principal I worked for, uh, you know, whenever an investor would... Uh, would ask him, you know, what he thought about the market and the market direction. He'd just make it up. <laughs> like, and, you know, two different back-to-back -back investor markets, he might say, oh, the market's going up. And the next one, he'd say the market's going down because no. that's not what we did. You know, we, the mark, we tried to get out of the market directional business. Yeah, no, no, definitely. It's about uh, portable alpha. The ability portable to, alpha. Yeah. yeah. The ability to perform in all, all, all markets. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your first piece of advice for a, an up and coming hedge fund manager, maybe an analyst who just you know, found himself a, a large uh, seed investment? Yeah, well, um, first I'd pick the right pool to swim in. So, you know, what, you know, if you think about investment process generally, um, most people have no idea what that means. And uh, they kind of, kind of make it up. To me, process is having a way to make the key decisions. So the first decision you got to make is what am I going to trade? You know, what are the stocks that, that are going to interest me? And, you know, you can do the, the college kid thing, you know, whatever's the meme stop on uh, Robin Hood, but that's not really a durable career path. Um, so picking an area of where you're going to develop an expertise that has enough volatility, enough liquidity, enough discorrelation between the individual stocks, and where there is a return to conducting research is kind of your first step. So yeah, you can be a REIT, in, a REIT expert and make a decent amount of money in REITs, or you could be a biotech you know, investor and make a fortune in biotech, you know, biotech has more liquidity, it has more uh, return on research, the companies are less correlated, that, that kind of thing. So picking the right space to be in is, you know, it's almost like asset allocation, right? You know, where, where, where do you want to be? Um, so I think that's the first key decision you're making. Awesome. So are you biased on 
for biotech, for instance, because there's. Well, I'm I'm, I'm biased for for volatility and discorrelation, yeah. and so biotech is is a great one. Healthcare in general has been a you know really great space for hedge funds. Um, consumer space can be great. Um, sometimes the industrial space uh, can be good. Um, Our AI has found that healthcare is the most predictive of the U.S. industries. Huh. On, on an industry on an industry by industry basis, actually, uh, yeah. in terms of looking at fundamental economic factors, what's actually going to drive the performance? Well, that's great. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you have also so many binary events, of course, in, in biotech. You know, will something be approved? Will it not be approved? Yeah. Uh, you know, are the doctors using it? Are the doctors not using it? Well, that's why the companies aren't, you know, correlated to each other, right? You know, there is a correlation driven by money, you know, rushing into healthcare at times, and that, that can push up the correlation in the spaces. But the underlying fundamentals of the companies are not always that correlated. And that, that, that's sure. valuable for a long short manager. For endowment, family office, institutional fundraising, what do you think is the biggest mistake uh, young fund managers make? Ooh. Well, I'd say, you know, not being able to articulate their process and then when they articulate it, not sticking with it. Um, thesis drift uh, is, you know, a human foible, not just in a particular stock, but also when you're running a book and you get a lot of pressure to chase the new, new thing as a new manager, whereas you should really stick to your expertise area. So we, you know, I had a lot of experience with PMs who were really good in say healthcare, and then they wanted to, you know, pick up some consumer stocks and they were disaster in consumer stocks. Um, depth of expertise in the tight net world is really important. So, you know, have an energy guy who's, who trades US energy stocks. And then, you know, one of his buddies talks to him about some Norwegian oil stock, and now he wants to trade Norway. Well, he doesn't know what he doesn't know. Like, watch those companies for a year, you know, get through, you know, a couple of earnings cycles, see how they work, see how they're correlated. Don't just like take flyers on things. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to mention was, you know, what, what's the scarce resource? Like oh. what, what doesn't a portfolio manager have enough of? Uh, you know, there's only two ways to add value in the investment process. You either have data that nobody else has, and hopefully you're doing that in a legal fashion, or you're connecting the dots between the data in a more insightful and actionable way than, than your competitors. And, you know, the best portfolio managers are doing some combination of the two. But if I they're remember, working- uh, may, may I interrupt? I remember Michael Retche, a uh, brilliant uh, yeah. data mind, said that when he was at uh, 0.72, uh, your your data optic spend was uh, just enormous. Is that, you think data spend is going to continue to rise every year? Will it ever yeah, level up? I do think I do think it's a it's an arms race, um, and there's a big trap of the middle in the hedge fund business now. You either have to be work at a place that's got everything, um, you know, multi manager platform like uh, Point Seventy Two or Millennium or Ballyazny or the like, or you've got to figure out some way to dance between the legs of those elephants and maybe deal in smaller cap names without as much capital. Um, and, and try not to get caught in their, um, you know, their correlation, you know, and their, and their liquidity issues. No, of course, you look at the last three months and small cap, even, you know, companies that had generally done well were still obliterated just because there yeah. was, a, you know, when there's a liquidity dry up, you know, all things, you know, all betas go to one. You know, so. Yeah, but that's a, that's a great opportunity if you're a, uh, if you're a small manager who can be nimble around that you know? yeah definitely so i guess being nimble you would then say uh leverage uh do you have an opinion on leverage uh ability to keep uh dry powder well leverage uh yes but you know leverage is constrained by your prime broker to some extent but i think that the key on that risk side is what's the what's the maximum draw you can stomach um, yep. and still, you know, come back from what's the maximum draw your investors will tolerate. And, you know, typically, uh, you know, max draw is about three times what your, your vol is. So, you know, if, 
that, that, that kind of dictates how much volume you want your overall portfolio to have, I think. Did, uh, in term, you know, when you were uh, at point 72, was there a, did you guys have a hard line in the sand for return? You know, XYZ fund manager has not uh, performed over six, 18 month period. Uh, was a certain leeway you'd give to others? Yeah. Um, so we, we did have an absolute return on gross exposure threshold that we were pushing people to try and achieve. But, uh, you know, it depended on the sector uh, to some extent. And, you know, we had multiple PMs in an industry. So how does that PM add value to the portfolio of portfolio managers? You know, are they non-correlated with the other PMs in their space? Do they, you know, be, are they in a certain area where there's more innovation occurring? So they're helping the knowledge base of the firm, uh, that kind of thing. In terms of time frame, like uh, that was the big myth that, you know, somebody had a bad quarter and they were out. It wasn't like that at all. Um, you could have a bad year. You just couldn't have two back-to-back -back bad years. And over rolling three-year periods, you should be at least at the mean um, for the PMs in your sector, uh, you know, if you want to keep your seat. Um, and if you want to grow, you should be accretive to the returns, right? But what about someone like a Bill Ackman, who's had, you know, two and three, you know, years back-to-back -back of uh, bad performance? Would you just say he's an outlier and so outlier? <laughs> Well, he's not really a he's not really a tight net guy, right? So he he's he's really making fewer concentrated big bets, and he's not really hedging those bets. Um, it's a different approach. It's a highly valid approach, um, and you know, for most of the time, I think after he's had a bad year, you're pretty that that's the best time to invest in him, <laughs> like because he he will not give up. You know. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. No, that's what uh, my uh, poppy always says. He's been a long time investor of his. Uh, yeah. That the the worst times are when he starts performing again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, fantastic. So, what do you think set aside the uh, performer versus the non-performer? Was it a work ethic? You know, I uh, I think of uh, my old friend Justin LaBelle, who's a you know brilliant performer. What do you think set aside a, a Justin from someone who did not stay with the firm? Um, consistency, um, consistency of effort, consistency of work habits. Um, you know, nobody works harder than Steve Cohen and he's clearly not working for the money anymore. Like he's been a billionaire for decades, right? It's really, um, it, it's not, it becomes not what you do. It's who you are. And I think the best portfolio managers, it is intrinsic to their identity to be a high performing portfolio manager and they will do uh, work as hard as it, it requires to do that. I mean, uh, you know, vacations, you know, time off, like that's not really a great concept for uh, the top performing uh, PMs. You, you know about the Sturgeon uh, thesis, right? The no, I do not. I'd love to, I'd love to. Oh. So science fiction writer in the, in the fifties who said, and, and this is what he said, I'm not paraphrasing, 90% of everything is crap. Kind of true. You know, 90% of portfolio managers are crap, right? You, you know, only 10% are really driving the performance. And, um, you know, as an investor and a, as a, as a in, in portfolio managers, you, you want to really be trying to find that 10% and avoiding the 90%. Yes. Um, but the, so, so here's, here's some of the habits, I think, um, you know, the scarce resource, which I alluded to earlier is time. You know, if you're working at a millennium or a 0.72, you, you have access to every information source. So it's not input into your investment process. Um, you're supported in every way, you know, managing your team, but um, it's really time. And the key value add in the investment process is idea generation. It's not in not really in portfolio construction or even risk management, like those can be bought, those can be systematized. Idea generation is always evolving, always changing. The regime you're in is always changing. You know, we went from a ZERP to, uh, you know, now rates are rising. We went from 
you know, most of the investment managers today have never lived with inflation. Like they have no idea how inflation is going to impact their books. And um, that's going to take a while for everybody to kind of get their arms around that kind of a thing. So there's no substitute for hard work. Um, you got to be smart enough, but being a genius doesn't mean you're going to outperform. And you have to be skeptical, like, because a lot of the information that's being fed to you is being fed by people with some agenda, you know, the companies, you know, who are always going to spin it positively, sell side analysts, you know, who fall in love with their sectors. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt and be a, be a little skeptical about everything. Awesome. So this was just a fantastic conversation, really, really wealth of information. Now to, to I guess, to finish off on a, a fun note, uh, you know, uh, Stevie just bought the Mets. Uh, are you a baseball fan yourself? Would you ever uh, want to work in baseball? Um, it's not my sport, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating sport to me. And I, I used to score games. And, uh, you know, that's the best way to understand how baseball works is to actually score the games. Um, how many years till Stevie gets the World Series? Who probably take him five. Awesome. Longer than he longer, I'm sure, than he'd like. He's not a man with infinite patience, but. Uh, yeah. um, um, well, I guess one last, last question. What do you think made Stevie the happiest beyond performance? in his, uh, you know, colleagues? Ooh, um, yeah, I, I, that's not, you'd have to ask him that question. <laughs> that's not something I have a huge amount of insight into his happiness state, uh, you know. I, I always found him an incredibly driven person who set an example for everybody, held himself to very high standards and set that example to, to everybody else. Um, just very energizing to be around him. Awesome. Well, this was, this was a lot of fun, Perry. And I, I really appreciate uh, the time. And for oh. everyone uh, who's watching, they should check out the, the BOMA Project, which is a, just a really fantastic organization that uh, Perry is involved with. And I know you devote so much of your time uh, to helping others. And I, I've always had just an enormous respect, amount of respect for you, Perry. Well, thank you, Alex. BOMAproject.org. Um, thank you for that plug. Um, yeah, we really are um, trying to empower people to help themselves, a hand up, not a handout kind of thing. Um, so thank you for, for mentioning that. I appreciate it. Oh, no. And, and likewise, on the respect, I mean, what you've achieved with, with your, your career and your company is just really impressive. Oh, you're very kind, Barry. Thank you so much. And I look forward to talking soon. Excellent.